How many chances do you think you'll have in your life for, for like a serious, high quality, intimate relationship? What do you guys think? How many chances are you going to have for that? Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I would say you probably top out at about five. Okay. Two down, three down. So. <laughs> okay, so, you know, that's not that many chances. <laughs> Plus, you get old quick. You know, by the time you're 45, you're not going to have a family. And well, you can do that sometimes if you're male. If you're female, maybe, but it gets pretty rough. And you're looking probably at that point at a fair bit of in vitro and that sort of interaction. It's tough. It's hard on people. So, you know, not only do you not have that many chances, you don't have that much time. So you've got to get it right. So if you get it wrong, it costs you. Like maybe it'll cost you five years. Five years is a long time. So, and three five-year costs is like... You've lost things there that you can't replace. Okay, so that's one part of it is you don't have that many chances and it's costly to, to burn up the time. Okay, the second thing is a divorce is very complicated. Like, it's not so bad if you get divorced to someone who's reasonable. But often the reason that you're getting divorced is that one or the other or both of you aren't that reasonable. And what that might mean is that you might be negotiating with someone whose basic goal is to make sure that you don't have another day of success in the next 20 years. And if that's their goal, they will attain it. So, and there's lots of ways people do that, and they usually do it by holding their children hostage. And people will definitely do that. They do it all the time. You know, so you want to avoid that. And then, you know, then of course it's hard on the relationship you have with your children. And like that's, those are probably the most relation, important relationships you have in your life. You know, it's like, might be parents, might be siblings, might be your, your partner, might be your kids. But I think when it comes right down to it, your parents are old, and so are you, but your kids aren't. And they're just as close, plus they need you. And so you start twisting and messing that about, boy, it's hard on your psyche. It's hard on the kids, too. So, you know... So then I'm just thinking about that and what you said about how that's a cost. If you, if you mess it up, that, and that's like a five-year cost, that's a, that's, it costs you, right? Oh, and it might be a 15-year cost if you're in a custody battle, and it'll yeah. cost you a quarter of a million dollars. Right. Or, or let's more. Say, yeah, but like, is it then, would you say, like being a psychologist, that it's better for people to like pursue a relationship that's like not good, to continue to do that and possibly incur further costs? than it is to just cut it off, because it wouldn't divorce me. Okay, it's a complicated question. What I would say is, don't make the kind of mistakes that get you into such a stupid relationship to begin with. Okay, because that's the answer to that question. And the way you do that is by trying not to delude yourself any more than is absolutely necessary. And that means, when you're in the damn relationship, tell the person the truth, and try to figure out what the truth is for you. And don't put up with any nonsense, and stand up for yourself. And also, aim towards the good, you know. If you do all those things, then your relationship is probably going to work. If you're trying to do all those things, really, and you have a partner that will not do that, then leave. But, it's a rare person who won't do that if they're stepped along the way properly and they learn how to do it. Now, not everyone's like that, because you do run into some people who are basically devoted towards mayhem and trouble. You know, but usually, you know, a person is a balance of striving for the good and, you know, messing about in the hell. And, you know, you're both like that when you start a relationship and you try to tilt it towards the good. And then you won't run into that problem. So, but you have to do that right from the beginning of the relationship, you know. It doesn't take that much to corrupt a relationship so that it's not really salvageable. Enough mistakes, three or four acts of infidelity, you're done. You aren't going to come back from that because the fundamental element of trust has been removed. And then you can't communicate with the person because you don't know if they're telling you the truth. And then you don't know if you're dealing with reality. And if you're not dealing with reality with your partner, it's like, good luck fixing that. It's like you're working on a ghost car while the real one is sitting in the shop with the motor out, you know. It's not going to get you anywhere.
So a lot of the issue is don't get in the trouble to begin with. If you are in the trouble, well, then you try to straighten yourself out and see if you can fix it. Well, if you can't, your options aren't great. And it depends on the particularities of the situation. Now, now I have people that I counsel, it's like, leave that person. And the rule is, they're lying to you, they aren't aiming up, and you won't be able to tolerate being with them for 10 years without becoming resentful, alcoholic, and homicidal. So that's a bad outcome. There's nothing you can do to avoid it, so you might as well leave. But, you know, you have to have that sorted out. It has to be the truth, because it's no fun. It's no good to leave someone who's struggling in, a, in the lurch, you know? And you think, well, I'm with this person. They're not going anywhere. You know, maybe they have an alcohol problem, and they're resentful. It's like, but I'm all they've got. Well, they bloody well better want to, help to fix that, because you're not going to be able to fix it. All that'll happen is you'll end up in the same place. Now, if they really want to fix it, more than anything, and they're willing to tell the truth about it, and willing to interact with you, then there's a ghost of a chance you might pull through it. But it's very hard to fix someone, and it's really hard to fix someone who does not want to be fixed. And there's lots of people like that. So. Well, I was just going to say, like a personal anecdote, my parents divorced when I was like three. So um, I know that a lot of people say, like, you're harming the kids. If you uh, get divorced, and I've, I've had to deal with a lot of like the tension between like choosing your parent and which one you agree with. But um, when everyone asks like, do you like are you upset that they got divorced? I'm like, I like, I see how much they fight now, and I can't imagine having that happen like 24 seven and being in that household. Yeah, well, I mean, this is why there isn't an answer to the question. Yeah. There's it depends on the particularities of the situation. And so, a lot, there's, there's lots of situations where a general answer doesn't suffice. But I would say, it is, this is a tough one. I can tell you what's happened since the divorce laws got, got liberalized. The first thing that happens is that all of you are going to be divorced at about the same rate as people would have 30 years ago. Because rich people still get married. And they generally don't get divorced. Poor people do not get married. And that's like 60% of the population, and it's ramping up quick. And there's no evidence whatsoever that that's anything but catastrophic. So kids who are raised by single parents do not do as well. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some single parents who are doing a stellar job. Obviously there are, and there's some married parents that do a terrible job. That's not the issue. The issue is the bulk of the evidence, and the bulk of the evidence strongly suggests that Children who are raised with two parents do better. Well, duh. Why? Well, why? It's impossible to raise children. Jesus, they're expensive, they're troublesome, they're <laughs> smart, and they're useless. You know, so, and you've got them for 20 years. It's like, you're going to do that by yourself? Sure you are. You know, you're going to be working at a horrible job 40 hours a week or more, like a retail job, for example, where they just treat you like a slave. And then you're going to go home to your miserable kids exhausted. It's like, that's not fun. And you know, it's increasingly the norm for huge chunks of our population. Like, elitist liberal types, like all of you, for example, don't pay much attention to what happens to people who are actually poor. But as far as I can tell, it's been a bloody catastrophe for them. You know, there's an old saying, when the upper class gets a cold, the lower class gets pneumonia. And you know, the thing about that saying, it's true. It's like, it's not a metaphor, it's literally the case. If an epidemic sweeps through a population, the population dies from the poor people upward, because they're so damn stressed. So, you know, I would say, with regards to marriage, now I've been married a long time, it's just about it's 26 years now, you know, and I've noticed a bunch of things about marriage. One is, two brains are better than one. And so if you actually communicate with your partner, because they're not like you. It's like you have a corpus callosum between you, you know, and they'll tell you things that you don't understand, you know, like when you're being stupid, you know, in a typically feminine way, say, or a typically masculine way, or in whatever stupid way you manage to be stupid, they'll point that out to you, you know, and that can be really helpful, even though it's extremely annoying, 
you know, and they can help you make decisions, and they're a good place to they're a good place to confess to, you know, and it's really helpful when you're trying to figure out how to discipline children, so that you're not a pathetic milksop who lets them run all over you, or some tyrant who you know likes to beat them with a stick when they sneeze, you know. Hopefully, you kind of find some pleasant middle ground in there, and it's a lot easier to do that with two people than with one, and then they can spell you off when you're exhausted. Particularly useful if you have small children, because you will be exhausted when you have small children. You know, plus the narrative of your life has continuity, and that's nice. You know, and if your home is set up properly, it's actually a pleasure to go to it. You know, it is a it is a buttress against the chaotic and and uncaring external world, because the external world, in many ways, doesn't give a damn about you. You know, so if you go home and it's set up reasonably well, it's like. Hey, you've got somewhere to belong. That's not so bad. Um, just uh, another um, another related situation that has personal relevance for me and might for other people too. That um, in in many situations, like when something bad happens, uh, you know, okay, yeah, I've got to do some kind of reparative thing, right? And uh, so, say it's like a health scare, you go, okay, I got to work on my diet. And then it's a divorce, it's like, all right, well, I've got to work through why I didn't think I was headed for a divorce for the last 20 years, but now it just happened. And, but, but in some situations, people know they got to repair, but they don't want to get something that would actually be repairing. So they go to people who are specialists in, like, other areas of, of like, personal, psychological dealings and stuff like that, anything but divorce. Like, attention deficit, work on your attention skills, or, like, work on these, uh, uh, or, like, um, assertiveness training or something like that. But, like... They're, not, they're, like, they're diligently avoiding the heart of the matter. And well, it, what would you okay. make of that? And, and if you were in a family with somebody like that, is there something you can do? Well, you know, some situations are like Humpty Dumpty. Right? There's no putting it back together. Yeah. Now, but, again, in terms of avoidance of those situations, yeah. it's like, you think about that hierarchy again. Well, divorce is a low-resolution, high-impact solution. Because it just tears a chunk of that hierarchy out and throws it away. Mm -hmm. That's a lot, and it's costly. Yeah. It's going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you think, well, what, what might you do instead of that? And the real answer is solve the damn problems as they arise. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's hard, and it, it requires drilling down. It really requires drilling down. So, one of the things I want to build, for example, which I haven't built yet, it's kind of like going to be like this future authoring thing that you guys do. I want to build a problem-solving matrix for... Mm -hmm. For couples, because cool. like because it, here's how not to get divorced from your wife. <laughs> Figure out how to set the table properly. <sighs> now, what does that mean? It's really, really complicated. Yeah. It's like, who's going to cook? When are they going to cook? Why are they cooking? How should you respond to it? Who buys groceries? What are the groceries going to be? Who's going to put them away? How do you say thanks when someone does something for you in the domestic environment? And what's happened, and this is part of the death of God, roughly speaking, is that the roles are gone. Okay, and what that means is you better be awake. Because it turns out that running a kitchen in a house is unbelievably complicated and difficult. And so you have to negotiate how to do it. And you're a terrible negotiator. You don't know how to decompose the damn problem to the point where you can solve it. You won't admit what you want. You won't admit what you're like. You won't pay any attention to what actually irritates you. You know, so you like to think that you're nice and easy to get along with, but you're not.